In my comparison between the two wills that seem to compete inside of humans, or two of the many wills that seem to compete inside of human beings, i.e. the pleasures of the flesh versus other pleasures, I guess we could call them. I mentioned yesterday the anecdote of Mardonius's tent, uh, where the Spartans, in destroying the Persian army, overran the Persian camp and located the, the Persian commander, Mardonius, his tent. He'd been killed in the battle full of sumptuous goodies and dancing girls and pretty boys and things like that, um, which the Spartan king, Pausanias, looked at and said, garbage, fit only for slaves, all this luxury. Give it to the slaves. Um, we're Spartans. This means nothing to us. Um, that's an interesting story illustrating the difference between the pleasures of the flesh and the, uh, would you call them pleasures? the rush or the gratification or the oomph of power. Spartans wanted power and they wanted glory. They wanted to be they wanted to go down in history as the people who smashed the Persian Empire. Um, <clears throat> there's an interesting view of that in the Indian tradition of uh, actual discomfort being sought not so much as an end in itself, but to evoke or to um, create or to promote power. Uh, there's all these stories in the ancient Indian texts and the Puranas and things like that about people who uh, went through so many austerities that the gods themselves had to obey them. They would sit there in the boiling sun for weeks on end or go without food for years or whatever you know they, they usually these tales are quite exaggerated but <clears throat> you get the idea the more you deliberately suffer the greater your power um, there's a the classic case I guess is uh, the Bhagirata or Bhagirat uh, who was um, an ancient Indian king who um, needed to cure a great drought so he um, went to the Himalayas and sat there and froze for, I don't know, many years, 10 years or something like this, didn't eat anything, um, boiled in the sun, sweated in, you know, and, you know, froze in the winter, that kind of thing, just, you know, the usual stuff that you do to deliberately make yourself suffer. You know, these cl classic Indian fakirs with their beds of nails and <clears throat> things like that. Personally, I think most of these people are fakes, but whatever. Um, the point is, though, if you deliberately make yourself suffer, this is the whole point of these austerities, you don't just gain more spiritual strength, you actually gain more raw power. So the story goes. But it's an interesting, or so the theory goes, it's an interesting statement on deliberately seeking to suffer, not as an end in itself, as has been suggested, but in order to gain something better than the pleasures of the flesh. Um, the pleasures of the flesh, i.e. cookies, orgasms, massages, the smell of incense, smoke, etc., um, versus the oomph, or the glory of having power, of saying, we defeated the Persians, and we will go down in history for this. And while we live, we answer to no one. We give commands. I'm not saying that that's a particularly laudable point of view, but what I'm saying, it, what I'm saying is that it's different from the gross physical pleasures. It's not Homer Simpson stuff. Um, okay, so what? A bunch of old Indian fairy tales tell about people who starved until gods that you know we know don't exist obeyed him, her, whatever. Well, I would say that there's more to this than meets the eye. Um, it's uh, as is always the case in Indian literature. All is not what it seems. You take Bhagiratha's tale where he starved until the gods had to send down rain to cure the horrible drought in his kingdom. Uh, that's what he did. He starved and fasted and suffered for so long that the gods had to obey him. They had no no, no choice. He, he coerced them into doing this. 
Um, and incidentally, only humans can do this in Indian mythology. It's a power the gods lack. Um, <clears throat> there are contemporary examples of this, believe it or not. <laughs> um, if you look at the case of Gandhi, um, the Indians tend to have a more, I don't know, jaded view of him. They don't see him as quite the saint that he's seen in the West, and for certain reasons, simply because most Indians would understand the concept of tapas and its coercive, power-seeking nature. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the whole impetus behind his drive to gain independence for India was to prove to the world, and the world was watching all the time via the newsreels when this was happening, uh, that the Indians were morally superior to the British, or that they could be morally superior to the British. Now, this was the important point. Um, so, what you would do is, you would deliberately provoke a response, absorb the blows, like you saw that in the movie Gandhi when they were marching on the salt mine and the British guards smashed them with sticks and the people didn't do anything in response because the cameras were rolling and they wanted to look like peaceful people being brutalized by these British people. Um, or Indians in the pay of British people is more like it. So, <clears throat> what you've done is, you've actually outflanked the British in that case by your willingness to let somebody smash you in the face with a billy club. You have become more powerful than that guy uh, simply because people are impressed by what you're doing. Anybody can hit somebody else in the head with a, with a stick. Anybody can do that. It doesn't take a lot of genius to do that. It takes a lot of work to walk right into that and look the guy in the eye as he's swinging that stick to crack your skull with it and maybe even smile at him while he's doing it. That is not an easy thing to do. That requires enormous self-discipline, which is why I always speak in favor of self-discipline. But remember, though, remember what I said, um, to the Indian mind, that's not quite as moral as one might think. These people who are walking into those blows from the billy clubs are not doing it to be nice. What they want is they want to occupy that salt mine. They want to shut it down. That's it. But they know that they don't really have an answer to the force that the British Empire was able to array against them. Um, but what they could do was take advantage of the fact that the whole world was watching and play passive-aggressive on a massive scale. That's um, kind of the modern secular version of Bhagirata's sacrifices or his austerities. Willingly accept suffering in order to gain power. Um, again, I'm not saying that that's laudable, and again, you have to look at that scene somewhat backhandedly. I'll see if I can find a link to it below. Um, those people who were who were marching on that salt uh, works were they were keen politicians and they knew what they were doing and the they the British didn't quite cotton on to what they were doing until it was too late. They were playing passive aggression um, in a very effective way against the British Empire and that's how the Indians saw it. They said, "Oh, this is a good weapon to use against the British." Remember, it's a weapon. <laughs> it's to gain power. The British were shown to be powerless. With all the weapons at their disposal, um, well, we are more powerful because your weapons are not something that has any power over us. You can kill us all. We still will not obey you. Now, that requires dedication and self-discipline, which, you know, that's why you have stories like 10-year fasts and things like that in the Puranas. Um, kind of... Uh, I'm kind of disabusing a few people of the idea of Gandhi as a saint, but because he wasn't a saint, if you ask me. He was just an old-fashioned Indian fakir who was using uh, the, his willingness to suffer to gain power. By the same token, Gandhi was perfectly willing to turn that ruthless um, satyagraha, as he called it, soul force, against his own followers when they didn't do what he wanted. Um... There's the other scene, or the other part where in the movie towards the end, where the Hindus and the Muslims are slaughtering each other. 
and in Gandhi's scheme of things, we can't allow this to happen because it makes us look horrible, it makes us look like a bunch of savages, and the whole point of my philosophy is that we are more moral than other people, and that's why we have the right to govern ourselves. Uh, the people who are ruling us are immoral while we're being moral. Sort of an interesting, another interesting view on the book of Job, isn't it? But <clears throat> God was being immoral in the book of Job, says uh, Boccaccio. Job was being moral. That's why God had to do what, what Job said. Um, interesting view, eh? But when the Hindus and the Muslims in, in pre- and post-independence India started to slaughter each other, Gandhi disciplined them. He stopped eating. He sat there and he suffered for days, long days. And that scared his followers. He suffered and he suffered and he suffered. And lo and behold, it actually made the rioters angry. Why are you interfering in our rioting? Stay out of this. This is not your affair. They understood the power of Gandhi's suffering, of his completely forsaking the pleasures of the flesh. Persistent rumors that he didn't forsake the pleasures of the flesh notwithstanding with pretty young women, but whatever. Um, that's tapas. You perform austerities so powerful that even the gods must obey you or millions of hate-filled rioters will eventually be forced to bow to your overwhelming power, your overwhelming tapas. Tapas being the uh, Sanskrit word for heat or the power generated by heat. Sort of think of, I don't know, nuclear fission or something like that, heat. Um, so you deliberately court suffering, but not because you want to suffer. What you want is you want power, and power is best uh, gained over other people's minds, and it, that's an interesting comment on what power really is, um, is power over the minds of others, suffer cause yourself to suffer. Publicly and spectacularly cause yourself to suffer. And never show the slightest inclination that you're going to weaken. You're playing a massive game of chicken with the people you are trying to control. Um, again, this requires enormous self-discipline and willingness to suffer. There's elements of this even in the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. You know, the, the scenes of the dogs in the water cannon barking at the unarmed and harmless, overtly, protesters who are actually being quite aggressive against um, white society in the 1950s and 60s uh, in order to basically revolutionize society, change everything. Um, aggressive for the right reasons, I suppose, as is also in the case of Gandhi, but still, it's aggression. <laughs> they're, they're storming barricades, but in a different way. Um, they're, they're destroying humans, in a, but in a different way. Um, you know, the case of General Dyer, in, uh, in, uh, also in the movie Gandhi, played by, I think it was Edward Fox, um, where he ordered his soldiers to open fire on an unarmed crowd of people at Jallianwala Bagh in, in uh, Amritsar. came down to us as the Amritsar Massacre. He was something of a martyr to Indian independence, and the reason I say that is he was simply doing what a good, decisive British general always would do. Cut through the tangle. Enough of this foolishness. We're stronger than these people, and we're going to demonstrate it. No, you're not, Mr. Dyer. <laughs> they're stronger than you, and they're going to demonstrate it to you. So he was a casualty, sort of, I, I don't know, I guess even a martyr. Uh, you notice at his trial, all these other British officers were saying, here, here, to what he did, because they were just thinking in terms of the old-fashioned brute force type thing, whereas the Indians were, had, were, you know, a couple of steps ahead of everybody all the time. Every dead Indian is a feather in our cap. That's 
pretty darned ruthless calculations, don't you think, on the behalf of the on behalf of the Indian independence agitators? Gandhi knew there would be <laughs> thousands of people killed in his um, drive for independence, and in fact, I would say that he was probably in an inner sense gratified when he got news of the Amritsar massacre in 1919. Oh, good. That's the end of the British Raj, and that was that was the turning point essentially. Um, further, you know, other contemporary um, examples of that. Now, can you imagine if you're an Israeli propaganda officer, say someone, one of those people that's uh, in charge of like something like Memory TV, where it's just um, Israeli uh, uh, use of the internet and the media to get across an Israel, a pro-Israeli or anti-Islamic uh, or Islamist sort of propaganda uh, to d diffuse all of this, what would your reaction have been to 9-11? Hmm? You would have gone, oh good, the Americans are now totally on our side. Now, I'm not trying to smear the Israelis here, but what I'm saying is, let's just say that you were, you were stepping into that world of passive aggression and deliberately courting suffering in order to gain power. And the ruthless calculations that take place in, in that kind of a dynamic, and I mean really ruthless, I believe Gandhi to have been a ruthless person. Um, well, there you go. You want power, so you will be ruthless to get it. You will be ruthless with yourself, and you will certainly be ruthless with others. It was physically peaceful and passive, but up here, it was violently, even viciously active. Um, again, no pleasure at all. Just the knowledge of what power really is. Um, the best case for that, I think, is the fall of communism, and it started off in Poland in 1988. The communist government had the police, the army, the, uh, the, the secret police. They had the Russian army right across the border. Uh, they had everything that they could possibly uh, have needed, overtly, to, to uh, uh, bring to bear raw power. But the Catholic Church, the priests, had the minds of the Polish people. <laughs> and they also knew that there's a good chance that the Polish government had lost the will to act in that way, the same way the British had lost the will to uh, fight to retain India. So what they did was they just marched in their millions and dared the authorities to shoot at them. I can even see meetings between, you know, the... Polish uh, upper clergy and communist leaders, and the clergy saying, yeah, you've got all that, all the tanks and, and police, and you've completely controlled the economy. One word from us, and the Polish people act. <laughs> Who's got the real power here? And um, I know how the Catholic Church works. Deliberately courting suffering as a means to exert power over other people is a very old technique. Um, and it's very effective. It's based on the idea, the egoistic idea, that we all want to be considered good people, more moral than the rest of our peers. And if you want to do that, um, the best way to do it is to suffer nobly. Nothing more egoistic than to suffer nobly. The martyr complex. Or even, I won't even say a martyr complex, because that's just in here. How about making a true martyr of yourself in the eyes of other people? <laughs> that's power, isn't it? And that is the antithesis of anything even remotely resembling any will to comfort. <laughs>